There's, there's our last guy. Thank you. Sorry. Hi. We were waiting for you anyway. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank, thanks, you guys, for, all, uh, for being here. And you can tell I do stand-up comedy as nervous as I am right now. Um, my name is Victor Agreta, Jr., and I'm the editor-in-chief of the unofficial Apple weblog, for those of you who uh, read internet websites. Um, so I was, I was not in the keynote thing. I was actually over at Jillian's. And if, if, since they are recording this and whatnot, we don't have enough mics to go around. At the end, we're going to do a Q&A thing. And so I'll just repeat. It's, it's going to be awkward, but I'll repeat your question when you ask something. So we'll do that at the end. But first, I want actually all of our four panelists to introduce themselves and tell us what they do. So, Leander? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Leander Caney, and I'm the uh, editor and publisher of Cult of Mac, which is another blog about Apple. And uh, written some books about Apple. The most recent one was um, Johnny Ive, The Genius Behind Apple's Greatest Products, which is a biography of uh, Johnny Ive. I'm Peter Cohen, and I'm managing editor of iMore, yet another Apple blog. And um, hi. My name is uh, Tom Maas, and I'm a developer. Uh, I work for a startup called Truecaller in Sweden. And I need to learn a new programming language. <laughs> Swiftly. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Joe Pizzillo. I'm a longtime Apple developer, former Apple employee from back in the 90s, and uh, co-founder of Push.io that's now part of the Oracle Marketing Cloud. And a round of applause for these guys, please. <laughs> Very lucky to have this brain trust on stage for you guys to throw peanuts at. And um, <laughs> so let's get right into it. I'm actually going to go in the order in which things were sort of announced. And so we'll leave the best for last, of course which is all the cool developer stuff. I, I want to ask, though, off the top real quick, what was the most boring thing that you saw today? Leander. Um, the thing they made the biggest deal about at the beginning, which was the translucency in the, uh, the menu bar. <laughs> I'm like, it was, you know, they were going on about that like four times, went on for about 20 minutes, and it was looking really, really depressing that we were going to have to like <laughs> sit through this stuff. But then it switched pretty quickly into some much more substantive stuff. But that was the most boring thing for me. Peter? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, given that I'm like firmly immersed in the OS X world, some of the iOS 8 stuff kind of put me to sleep a little bit. Yeah, I wasn't really bored that we didn't get any like, half hour long game demos this time. So that was a relief. Um, I think. For me, the beginning of the iOS 8 stuff started off kind of slowly, but then later we saw that it was all in the development on the development side that it was really exciting. So, um, not a boring keynote. Yeah, I, I didn't find any of it boring. Although uh, it's interesting how much you know, some of the things that we've taken for granted for so long are suddenly like being re-presented as kind of fresh or new. Uh, you know, there was uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of eye candy uh, by comparison to years past, but. Uh, So just in Mac OS right now, what's the number one thing that you're looking forward to coming down the line in, in uh, Yosemite? Leander? Um, the collaborative stuff. What do they call it? I forget. There's all these things. I've forgotten the name of every single thing. Continuity. Feature. Yeah, the continuity yeah. stuff. That looked really uh, fresh. I haven't seen that on any other platform, am mm. I right? And uh, it looked totally useful. I mean, it's exactly how I work. Um, you know, always starting a, an email on one device and then Having to do something crazy like you know I don't know save it as a draft, but then sometimes it doesn't show up, um, and you know this looked like something I could really use. Except I was a little bit worried about privacy. You know what happens if you're looking at something you know you shouldn't be looking at, and someone else picks up your iPad in the living room like one of your kids. You My know? kids playing I mean, Minecraft, and yeah, all of a sudden. Right, something. Yeah. You want to finish <laughs> browsing porn on this? Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, no. But, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Private sessions. Actually, I'm, I'm curious how many people here have like hacks and kludges and whatnot that they've cobbled together to sort of simulate continuity. You might here have like third party apps and whatnot that, yeah, there's, there's several out there that do this. What about you, Peter? Um, yeah, I, I, that's definitely the, the standout for me uh, with the OS X stuff that I'm really excited about. I, I have struggled um, to really do a coherent uh, workflow from. Uh, Mac to iOS, so that part's very exciting. Um, the idea of using my Mac as a speakerphone is incredibly appealing to me um, because I think I've wanted to talk on my Mac, you know, using it as a phone for longer than I've had an iPhone. So that part uh, is 
really, really exciting. Um, the, the other part of it, though, that... Some of the greatest developers in the world, by the way, just walked in. Absolutely. So. <laughs> the other part of it that really excites me is um, uh, with, with handoff, you know, we've, we've got these devices out there, like um, 12 South makes this product called the Hover Bar, yep. that, you know, you can put your iPad next to your... Uh, your Mac monitor, and uh, I think they're probably going to sell a million of those now that uh, uh, once this stuff uh, becomes available. Yeah, it was definitely continuity for me as well, I think. Um, I think many of us use Dropbox to kind of cobble something together for that purpose today, uh, which didn't get any mention at all today. Um, and then the second thing I'm wondering about kind of continuity is um, how soon will this open up for third-party apps? Is this going to be an Apple-only thing? I didn't really get any hints towards that in the keynote, so that should be uh, interesting to see. I would go with continuity as well, although I'm going to disagree about the phone. I, the last thing I want to do is make more phone calls or have more, like, you know, stuff popping. Just, like, I, I felt so bad for his mom. I mean, come on. You know, it's like, it's, you got to have rule number one, always take your mom's call, right? It's just like there's something about it where it's just like I want a little more uninterrupted time. Uh, and less kind of the sense that, you know, I'm going to get new, a new set of interruptions on the desktop. So I, what's interesting, I think, is that with the continuity thing, this is something that obviously everybody has a need for, right? Um, and some people who are technically aware have been cobbling things together. And I noticed that there were a few other things that we've maybe been using tools similar to these already. And the one that really stood out was Spotlight looks a lot like Alfred all of a sudden. All right. Um, so I, I'm just curious if there was anything else that you guys saw that that reminds you of something that maybe not you know these aren't Sherlock things, right? I'm going to continue to use Alfred because obviously Alfred does a lot more than Spotlight was being shown to use. But is there anything in your tool set now that you saw today that you're going to quit using um, because of Apple bringing it into a more integrated way? Dropbox. Dropbox. Yeah, Dropbox. Is that the mail thing, the mail messages? Possibly sugar sink too. Sugar sink, okay. Right on. Anybody else out there? Does that show a hand so you see stuff? You might get rid of Dropbox today. Right on. Oh, look at that. Well, it goes back to what was Steve Jobs' quote about Dropbox that it was a, a feature, not an application, yes. right? Yeah, right. and I, iCloud Drive kind of proves that Apple is sort of on the same wavelength there. Now, uh, if it works, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's a big if. Yeah. When it comes to Apple in the cloud, that's a big if. So that's the thing. I'm curious as you, what, what you guys think about iCloud Drive because, uh, I mean, for normals, right? You know, let's go back to this idea that normal human beings use these things. How big is that? How big a deal is that going to be? Yep. 
Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, there's been a... Yes. Yep. There's, and there's been, there, there's been a, a contingent of us for a very long time now who have said, you know, Apple, we, we want more power out of our iOS devices. We need a file system. And Apple's not going to give us a file system, but iCloud Drive kind of gets us to... It's one of these situations where Apple sort of answers the problem by developing their own solution for it instead of giving us exactly what we're asking for. That's right. That's right. Yep. And iCloud Drive is going to work on, on Windows, so, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as they say, so it's, yeah, we'll it's, see what happens. It's going to be interesting to see that integration. It's sort of like the, uh, the mail messages, right? So you can attach up to five gigabyte files, but they're not really attached. They're in the cloud, and so people can get them if they need to. In mail, this obviously works great, but again, this is, I mean, this is not a typical Apple, right? I mean, the, their products are going to get the best experience. When you go into Windows, you'll have to go to something and download it, which makes it a lot like a lot of other services that you have to go click a link and download something that's bigger than you can attach in a file. Um, but it also seems like iCloud Drive, in terms of you can use other services and whatnot, is sort of like the, I don't want to say training wheels, but it's like for most people, that seems like that'll be an acceptable solution, right? Yeah. Um, how many I, I, I don't know about that. I mean, no. All right. I the, I, I wear two hats, right? I, I'm I, I'm the managing editor for iMore. I also spend my weekends working at an Apple retailer, a third-party retailer, not an Apple store. Otherwise, I would be shot on sight for talking about it outside of the Apple retail store. But anyway, um, I talk to a lot of people, muggles, if you will, just regular, normal users, not us. You know, the people that Apple actually sells shit to, um, who have absolutely no trust in the cloud whatsoever. You know, I don't use the cloud, why not? Because I don't want Apple to have my things or I don't understand how it works. And because I don't understand how it works, I'm scared to use it. So Apple has an, a, a, a long road to hoe to convince the millions of people who use these products that this is something worth using. I think it's an easy sell to everybody in this room, but they're preaching to the choir. So what I'm curious about that, because the one thing that I think uh, gives us a lot of hope is the fact that you can say, you can back up all of your photos in the cloud now, right? We've seen, everyone here has seen service after service fail in that regard. And a big part for my problem, like I use Flickr, and I've been a pro member for years and years and years, right? <laughs> Until they screwed up the UI. And, um, but the thing is, is that there's still extra steps I have to take to upload all of my photos. If I had a seamless integration with that, which is what iCloud does, you take the picture, it's there, exactly. How many people here are actually still just on the five gig free plan? Yeah, yeah me too, okay. How many people are gonna upgrade now? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think for a dollar a month, to have, really to make the promise to say all of your photos and the edits and everything, I mean, it's like iPhoto in the cloud, basically. Of course, they didn't say that dreaded word because no one has a real fondness for iPhoto, I don't think. But um, bless its heart. That's right. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the flip side, though, of the whole issue about storage or what have you is people that lose stuff that don't make backups, right? So, right. I mean, sort of your choice. I mean, how, how many people have had a hard drive failure? Yeah. Anybody has not ever had a hard drive failure in their life? I won, all right. Kill the witch! <laughs> 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 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's all solid state now, right? Sure. Yeah. So. We can hope. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, we're going to get to Swift here in a second. I'll table that for just a second because I definitely want to dive into Swift. But well, the photos in the cloud, did they mention videos? Was that yeah, the video yeah. is, uh, and, and that again too because I know a lot of people who take more than just a six-second Vine video. You know, I have people who, who videotape their entire comedy set, and if you do three open mics a week, that's 15 minutes a week. That adds up very quickly. So I, my prediction is that they're going to sell a ton of the 20-gig plans. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever they do. Yes. I saw something about petabytes in there. I, that's what I was going to say. Because I'm, I was going to try to demonstrate here, but I have this perpetual problem when I go to take a picture. Up, oh, there's not enough memory yeah. to take a photo. And, <laughs> like, that's what I want. That to me is the big win from, yeah. from this. Yes. I understand. I yeah. just bet. Yeah. Sign me up for the petabyte plan. Is I guess what I'm getting at. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a cloud. Yeah, that was a cloud. Yeah. Dave? It's all the same cloud. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know how I solved the problem? I got another one. <laughs> one's his phone iPhone, and one's his exactly. photo iPhone. Exactly. And yeah. we wonder why Apple is such a big company. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's going to have to be iCloud, yeah. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be out there. There are actually a number of unanswered questions that we had actually talked about. Like you were just asking that one. There's another one that I want to ask you guys. Um, one of the first things you talked about were widgets and the notification center and how you can customize things now. Do you think dashboard is dead? It very much felt like a dashboard replacement to me. They never yeah. showed dashboard. Not that they've shown dashboard in yeah. years, but. I'm surprised it was still alive last year. Me too. And for that matter, Spotlight seems to be replacing uh, Launchpad. Yes. Yeah, how many people here use Launchpad? <laughs> right. Okay. One. Yeah. We got one. Once in a while, Is that right? the same guy? I like <laughs> Just wait until your hard drive crashes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? I noticed that too. Yeah, it's interesting. But clearly the functionality, uh, you know, they're migrating it over to Spotlight. But, uh, you know, to your question, I think that um, – the interesting thing for me about Notification Center and widgets is that it was uh, an example of some parallel development between iOS 8 and uh, OS 10. Yep. You know, we're always talking about the, uh, for, for as long as, as the iPhone, you know, caught fire and once Apple opened up iOS development, I think that there's been this underlying fear, uh, especially in the OS 10 developer community, that Apple was iOSifying OS 10. And I think that as time has gone on, um, Definitely with Mavericks, and um, even more so now with Yosemite. We're, we're seeing Apple's um, uh, strategy as blurring the lines between the two operating systems, but understanding that they're very distinct workspaces, that people don't use their Macs the same way that they use their iOS devices, but let's not just blur the line, let's obliterate it altogether and try to make that experience between OS X and iOS as seamless as possible. What was the figure that, uh, that, that they mentioned about um, uh, the number of new users to Apple products? It was like yeah. 120 over, million Over 130 last year. million new customers in the last 12 months. Just in the last 12 months yeah. who are completely new to it, to iOS. Now bear in mind that if you new walk to in... Apple, even. Yep. New, new to Apple, New to Apple, right. Yep. Now bear in mind that if you walk into you know, an Apple store, 
um, and, and look around at the people who are buying Macs for the first time, half of them are new to the Mac platform. Of that percentage, a great deal and a growing percentage of them are coming to Mac because of their experience with another Apple product, whether it's an iPod or more than likely an iPhone or an iPad. They've got that experience. So their, their, their experience with Apple products is being driven by understanding how iOS works and how that interface works. So making that, that experience between iOS and OS X as seamless as possible is something that behooves Apple a great deal, I think. You had something? Oh, sorry. We'll get there when we have touch screens on our well, Macs. Well, you should also put touch screens on <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah. 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 What, what were they using to, to run uh, the web searches on Spotlight? Huh? Yeah, I was curious to see what was powering it. Cause, uh, there was definitely a lot of nods to Bing. Yeah, there was a and, Wikipedia and shortcut Wikipedia, that was interesting. Right, which Ansel Adam thing. it seems to be like tied very tightly with that. So I don't know that they're doing a Google search. Yeah. Um, well, and then later he mentioned Google, and it's got the suggested searches because Google does do a good job of that. One thing that I thought was interesting, though, was when they mentioned HomeKit, Nest was nowhere to be found. No. <laughs> Odd, that. They, they showed a thermostat. They showed a thermostat, but it wasn't Nest, yes. I think it was a Honeywell or something. <laughs> um, speaking of that, let's actually, let's talk about HomeKit for a minute. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to what you guys think is, uh, first of all, there's obviously a software component. Do you think Apple's going to get into the hardware side of that at all? First of all, talk about the software side, and then we can talk about hardware. Speculation. You're good at speculation, Leanne. <laughs> good at making it up. Um, I have no idea. You know, it was, um, I, I just bought a couple of home automation systems um, an alarm system for my office, and the thing is a huge pain, um, even though it's like an iris system from Lowe's, which is supposed to be dead easy. But it's been nothing but a headache. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'd love to see them, you know, uh, simplify that. But I, I think there's still that kind of, you know, for the first time, they actually gave me a really good use case for a home automation system, which is like, Siri, I'm going to bed. Right. Yep. And it turns everything off. Before that, it was like a lot of tinkering around. I mean, why don't, you know, I'm, I'm not that lazy that I can't get up and turn a light off. Or reach for the you know the TV remote or whatever. I think you speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be nice if all the doors locked. I mean, the, the hard thing with hardware is that if you're going to make this stuff work, you've got to go around and retrofit everything in your house. And I can't see people um, spending a fortune on light switches and locks and and you know replacing all this stuff. So I think. Huh? True, but we're not we're not to that one yet. They haven't renounced that thing yet. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the, 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 and Leander goes to the, the, the core of it, which is that there's a huge amount of pain in actually getting it to work. But when the technology works, it's beautiful. I mean, you know, you take a look at these, um, uh, these Bluetooth-based um, LED systems, like the Philips Hue and uh, what's mm -hmm. the other one? The, um, uh, I've, what's it, what is it? Yeah, there are a few of them out there. But, you know, they, they're based on, like, proximity sensors. So if you walk into a room, a light will all of a sudden go on. Well, you know, I'm having my office rewired right now, and that's what I'm planning on putting in all the pots, you know, in the ceiling is, you know, going to be these. So I don't ever have to operate a light switch again. And it's not a matter of me being too lazy to operate a light switch. It's understanding that there is, uh, you know, an efficiency here that, that, that is going to improve the quality of what I'm doing. So I don't really think that Apple has to get into the hardware end of this. As long as the hardware manufacturers are on board with what Apple is doing, mm -hmm. and they're making it as seamless as possible for people to use. Well, I mean, I think that's the idea, is that you'll be able to set up triggers. That's really the beauty of this, it seems like. And you, you guys, being developers, can talk a little bit more to this, is that it's simplifying things, sort of like Passbook tried to do, you know, you still have to have this Walgreens app, Starbucks app, but I now conveniently put them in a little folder at the very end of the springboard, right? And Passbook has everything all in one place. So that seems to have been the sort of pilot project for this. 
And then what, what would you guys do with this as developers? I, I think it's providing one common SDK that yeah. developers can use. I don't see Apple getting into the hardware side of this because this is a really fragmented space. It doesn't have the kind of one-size-fits-all kind of product solution that mm -hmm. Apple likes to do. Um, so I, I, I think it's something that's more akin to like, like Passbook, like you're saying, or the CarPlay, what they're doing there now. Yep. So they set a couple of standards. They provide an SDK so people can build apps. And then it's up to the manufacturers to fit into that. Um, so, yeah, but it's, I'm still puzzled. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even, I mean, like the whole thing about Siri, I'm going to bed or whatever. The thing's got it, but it's going to know when I'm asleep, supposedly, right? I mean, right. I showed that. Uh, so, yeah, M7 knows. Yeah, M7 <laughs> knows if I'm asleep. It knows when I'm awake. It knows if I've been good. It knows if I've been, no, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, and the other thing I was thinking about relative to this, and, you know, we always say these things like, well, Apple wouldn't do this. Apple wouldn't do that. The one that was a curveball for me a couple of years back was when they introduced the recyclable, or I'm sorry, rechargeable batteries. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? It wasn't something, I mean, great thing, and obviously we use it in so many different places, in, in the mice and all that. Um, but uh, just the fact that they did that was very forward-thinking, it felt like. It was actually practical and useful. So I could see Apple taking some different uh, approach, right? Maybe they're not going to actually make light bulbs, obviously, but maybe they do make some kind of, you know, intermediary between the wall socket and other devices. Right. Yeah, the and one then that becomes part of this mesh or what have you. Maybe it'll be, maybe the one piece of hardware I can see them doing is maybe an Apple TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah, is. Right. <laughs> yeah. In theory, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But, you know, for the home automation that would, like, take care of that, be the hub for that, too. Yeah. Well, like, for instance, Apple doesn't make iBeacons. They provide a set of that's standards. That's right. Correct. Yeah. Well, that's not yeah. true. I have two iBeacons in my pocket right now, so, yeah. Correct. That's <laughs> yeah, the standard's there, and, and you adhere to it, right. Yeah. Especially yeah. when I'm lying in bed, I don't want to do that. No. Yeah. Uh, let me just throw that. That, oh, that, yeah. that was the number one miss. I mean, this may be one of your questions coming up, but like one of the missing things today was any talk about iBeacons. I was surprised. I thought there would be a lot. Yeah. More. Actually, Given how much ex industry excitement there is about the technology, I thought there would have been more. That's true. Or there's, anything. There's, on there's it, probably really. a couple of sessions on it, though. Well, almost well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, Sorry, the, you were the whole thing felt oh. so packed. There, there's probably yeah. lots of stuff hidden That's in right, the sessions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Big uh, hats off to uh, Hair Force One, too. I mean, that guy carried the show. <laughs> Absolutely. And Absolutely. The jokes, those of them were pretty funny. I mean, it's, you know. It's pretty excellent, yeah. yeah. I yes. think one of the things people are underestimating or at least not talking about when it comes to like Apple's design choices or anything that I agree that I don't think they have any design like making the devices, you know, we're not going to use the word pilot, but uh, all of these different smart home platforms all come with hubs. You know, you buy the Well, and, and let's not forget that Apple can still make hardware. They're very good at that. So if they see something that's a terrible product, like maybe the Bluetooth locks are not up to par, then they can create a lock. But I think that like what Leander was saying is very important, which is that people are not going to go out and spend $4,000 upgrading everything in their home to, to have Bluetooth in it, right? So what's going to happen is you may go for Christmas every year or whatever. You may get this, you may get this, you may get this. And within four years, you've replaced these things in your home. So now, and as those come online, then you realize, oh, look, I, now it controls that. Now it controls that. So that seems to be a much smarter way uh, of getting people into the ecosystem. And then if Apple does come out with a lock or lights or whatever, people say, well, you know, I'm already using my iPhone to control everything. Why wouldn't I buy this better experience? Uh, Speaking of mythical hardware stuff, though, and this ties nicely into HealthKit, so where's the iWatch? <laughs> where's, where's any hardware announcement? Yeah, it's ah. a developer show. Well, yeah, well, yeah, Phil Schiller, right? So there was no hardware. Hardware, no phone. Yeah, no, um, you know, so what about, but what about HealthKit and what about hardware in terms of that? Because that still seems, that seems even more fragmented than the home space. 
they're laying yeah. the foundation. It's a developers conference, right? So they're, they're putting out the SDKs and they've got home, health, and uh, what was the other one? <laughs> I didn't hear that one. Oh, wait. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the, the rumors are, we'll see it later this year. Hey, anyone else That's disappointed that OS 10 weed isn't actually a thing? <laughs> <laughs> So what about, I'm interested in the developer perspective, perspective in terms of health kit. I mean, this seems like, though, a really obnoxious problem because with lights, with uh, locks, with most of the stuff in your house, it's an on-off situation, right? We're still X10 sort of era. There's a little bit you can do with the hue and that sort of thing, changing colors and whatnot. Health is a completely different ball of wax. Um, and it made me a little bit nervous that they said, well, we're working with the Mayo Clinic, which is awesome. But there's a few other hospitals in the world. So it's like my, my concern is, do you think that there's going to be enough buy-in for this to really make a, a, a substantial difference in this market? For the record, nobody outside the US knows what the hell the Mayo Clinic is. <laughs> it, there you go, right? Yeah. Clinic. Yeah. But a lot of other people don't know what. A bunch of other uh, hospitals or, and healthcare groups that were part of a consortium. I think they, I don't know if yeah. they called it a consortium. But there were, yeah, there were a whole yeah. bunch of <laughs> yeah. logos. Didn't they meet with the NIH yeah. last year? Yeah. What's that? They had a big meeting with the NIH. Oh, did they? Uh, yeah, so. So if there's a zombie outbreak, health kit's going to be like, <laughs> yeah. alert. Yeah. You get a new push notification. You're a zombie. Quick show of hands. Oh, yeah. Who, get a microphone who here, up here. Who here is doing EHR work? Explain right. what that is real quick to the other folks. What's that? EHR. Electronic health records. Okay. Hey, hey. And I'm sure that the, what, two, three of you who raised your hands know this is a nightmare, an interoperability nightmare. Everybody's got their own custom solutions. No one co communicates with one another. Then you've got HIPAA on top of that right. complicating things. So does anybody here realistically think that Apple is going to make a really big play in the healthcare business? Well, I, so I'd like to just comment on that in the context of the Internet for Things, and we're talking about whether or not Apple gets into... Uh, the device game, in my observation, when you looked at their partner lists, in both cases, they're clearly going to partner with industry for the device, in both cases. So for the medical information, they took a siloed group of uh, hospitals that probably have a, you know, the same basic system that they run on and said, we're going to partner with you. I think it's a good first step because if you push in that space and you make any movement, McKesson's going to jump on board. The, uh, you know, the other health providers are going to jump on board and say, I want the SDK also. And, and they have the leverage with the number of devices that are out there. So I think it's a great strategy, and I think that that's probably the right way to approach it. I don't think that Apple needs to go and innovate on, uh, on health sticks and necessarily even have a, uh, you know, blood pr pressure monitor sensor or, uh, you know, raw data capture, I think you can partner with other companies that already do that. You give them that SDK where it all comes back to an integrated health system on the phone, that's the genius in my mind. Yeah. I, and same thing for the Internet of Things. That right. There's an interface, a single app, and all of a sudden when you want to control your home, I don't have to go to Chamberlain's device, I don't have to go to Nest, I go to my one Apple you know, interface for thermostat, lights, uh, garage door. And it seems to me also that if they allow the people who make these apps uh, or if the hospitals who maybe integrate with these things to keep that data and keep it secure and safe, uh, which they said that they want to do that, uh, that's going to be really key to buy in as well because you don't want that fragmented. And then also people don't want to feel like Apple's taking all of that data and doing something with it either because that's kind of an important thing. So we had another person here. Use the microphone if you don't mind. So if Apple isn't going to be making any of their own data collection devices, why did Nike pull the plug on the fuel band? Good question. The iWatch. Well, we, we've heard rumors, well, right? The, the, answer, the, answer is because, <laughs> the easy answer is because Nike makes sneakers, and they make clothes, and they make lots of things. The Fitbit was, you know, a very marginal device for them. You know, they're, they're, the, the core of their business is elsewhere. So the fact that they have put it on life support for all intents and purposes didn't surprise me. The M7 chip does a, little, a few of those things, yeah. And I, I think we're going to continue to see more sensors built in 
to the iPhone, right? Because that's part of, and we've seen mm -hmm. tons of yeah. patents around this, the awareness of your device and the context in which it's in. I mean, ideally, and this was a patent years ago that they had, they, they showed how they want to be able to tell if you've pulled it out of your pocket to do something, or if you've laid it on a table, or if you're driving in your car, all of those contextual awareness things. Um, and so more sensors, more better, right? Um, real quick, uh, let's see if we can get a microphone to this guy right here. And we're gonna, we're gonna to switch over to iOS and some of the iOS 8 stuff in just a minute as well, not just HealthKit and all of that, but some of the inter-app things. Go ahead. For those on the live stream, what he basically just explained was bring your own medical device. So, oh, send the mic the other way. We're switching it up on you. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about iOS and uh, some of the new features. What's the killer feature for you guys on the panel? I can answer that immediately. It's the uh, parental approval of apps. That's like, <laughs> yes. that was written for my yes. son, basically, yeah, yeah. Would you register one of your touch ID, one of his fingers on your touch ID, so he can just like buy, Absolutely go crazy? Not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. As long as you don't have to be more than four kids. Right. 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 Well, yeah. There's that too. But yeah, but killer, killer feature for you. Um, yeah, I think all the family stuff was uh, pretty interesting. Um, the other thing, well, the the biggest killer feature and the one that that all the developers I know had been hoping for was the remote view controller stuff, the stuff where you can show part of your app's interface in another uh, app, mm -hmm. that bigger, that the larger integration between apps yeah. is something everybody's been wishing for for a long right. time. Yeah, and then if I can add one thing, um, it's uh, different keyboards. Um, yes. Like um, a friend was sitting <laughs> next to me, his comment was like, finally somebody else can fix that shift key. So um, <laughs> I, I think that's going to be a, a, a really interesting change as well. And of course, already the lists are out of people saying like everything uh, Apple called up to Android with. Um, well, that's but, always. And yeah. They take their time they, and exactly they do it right. right. Yeah. So. Peter? Um, so everybody looking forward to getting SwiftKey on their <laughs> iOS device? Okay. Uh, extensibility. Extensibility looks really cool. And it could because it, that, that answers a big problem that we've had with, uh, with iOS for a very long time. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all are going to do with that. <laughs> What about you, Leander? Uh, I guess the sharing data between apps, which uh, we talked about before. Yeah. And I actually can't remember. What else was there? Yeah, well, it was the so other one much. I'll go for is metal, because I, I love okay. my candy, and that was just Yeah, fun. metal, it looks fantastic. But before I get to that, actually, I want to talk about, no one mentioned AirDrop now working between Mac oh, and iOS, yeah. right? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. That's, that's because I keep forgetting we didn't already have that. That's, <laughs> like, that's such a gimme. <laughs> But it's, it's funny because we're in the uh, IRC chat for the live blog at 2 all right? And Erica Sadoon, uh, who some of you probably recognize that name, um, she said, well, this has been a boring keynote. And what's funny about that is that she says that every keynote. Yeah. Um, this was so much stuff in there that we, we, uh, we didn't even mention AirDrop in this conversation right here, right? Like, that's a huge thing. We've all been waiting for that for so long. But then this comes along, and we're like, oh my god, that's even better. So I think it's been fairly amazing for that. Here, wait, let's get a microphone on you, because the people of the live stream, have pity on them over at Jillian's. They're, they're hanging out, and uh, we're going to pass a mic down to you in just a second. But yeah. Quickly, there, I didn't hear anything about hardware. No, yeah. Not a hardware show. There, yeah, there was, it wasn't a hardware show, which I think people have set up the, uh, the false assumption 
that hardware has to be announced at WWDC, and that's that's the media's fault. Don't blame yeah. me, but other people. Uh, also, I, um, I think it's Sue is what he's driving over there. <laughs> also, one of the biggest thing I think uh, was message i messages, where you can lift your phone to talk and send a voice message, and yes. the other person can listen and reply uh, back. Yeah, yeah. I think that is huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah that looks really good because I mean, messaging, yeah, definitely is um, kind of primitive right. right now. And, you know, next generation email, that looked great. Also Siri, I thought. Siri, you know, like yeah. no, no touch Siri. That's right. That'll make a huge difference because I, I have, you know, Android envy when I see. That it. Motorola, I, I saw somebody using that. Yeah. And that's a really, really nice feature. If you've ever used it, the difference is just phenomenal. And there's actually an ad, if some of you guys remember, there was an ad uh, several months ago last year where they show someone, it's like, are you, is your phone causing you to work more than you should or whatever? And they show it how someone has to push the button to get Siri. This directly addresses that. Yeah, so works, Siri's always works, listening. Right. So yeah, <laughs> don't be scared. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you concerned that actually you can pick up your phone and without authentication, actually you can reply back to it? That I was a little bit surprised, even without touch ID. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah, what do you guys think? about that. I, I had that thought as well. So security and... Well, we, we haven't seen how it works in detail yet. There might That's just not be a passcode on that phone. I don't know. That's uh, right. Yeah. yeah. There, there are, keep in mind, there's a lot of stuff in the demos that they don't do, like tap in their passcode every time they open it after five minutes later, right? So, or touch ID, exactly. Yeah. So I'm thinking probably a touch ID. Well, and I mean, the way it works on OS X is that users can choose whether or not they want to allow replying to notifications from the lock screen on a per application basis, That's whether right. Apple is going to do that with this or if they're going to do something like you can, like they do with um, Control Center, where yep. you can choose, you know, yes on lock screen, no on lock screen for everything. I think that makes a lot of sense in this instance. Yeah. And isn't Touch ID, the API, isn't that a big deal? It's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mo mobile payments? Yeah, Touch ID. Are you guys ID. all going to use it? Well, not mobile payments, but being able to use Touch ID to authenticate, basically, instead of having to type in a password all the time. I think that's going to be big. But it also makes me think that Touch ID is going to be on all the hardware very soon, right? Yeah, it's definitely on the next yeah. iPad. Yeah, let's hope it's on, on Macs. That would be great. So the only other thing I was going to add is that there was a lot of talk about security, right? It came up over and over and over again. They, they dinged Android with it. Mm -hmm. uh, they talked about the importance of privacy and, you know, your own data and protection of, of your information frequently throughout the presentation. So it feels like that might just be a, uh, you know, demo oversight, if you will. I mean, the, the good news from my perspective is they're clearly putting a lot of time and attention into it. And, you know, that's what we need is smart people thinking about these issues. Speaking of smart people, go ahead. Did you have something? I'm done. <laughs> I, th I think just in general, maybe that, that's not specific to iOS, but like all the cloud-based stuff, I mean, uh, Apple's had kind of a spotty um, like track record in, the, in that space. Generous. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now they're, like, they're looking to replace services like Parse, it looks uh, yep. like. So that's one of the big question marks to me. Like how, is that, how is that working? And they're like... Like half the demos involved some kind of server-side component. You're sending voice messages back and forth. You're yep. syncing all your photos to the cloud. I mean, that, there's there's a lot of cloud stuff throughout the um, throughout the keynotes, and I'm just wondering like how well is that going to work? How well is it going to hold up? Um, yeah, well, even getting uh, even getting SMS on your Mac, yeah. like there's a whole procedure that has to be involved in in that because it's not just a you know. I mean, iMessage and SMS are a completely different kind of a thing. So that's, to me, that's incredibly exciting because I have plenty of Android. Keep in mind, I know a bunch of comedians, most of whom can't afford Apple devices. Uh, so that's a big deal to be able to do that. Sorry. <laughs> It actually comes to the, your to your phone and then bounces to your Mac, or because there's no have other to, way yeah. to to intercept that from uh, yeah. from the network perspective. And that's something right. That's something that they kind of, they didn't get into in the keynote. But I'm pretty sure that you'd have to have a, a cell phone and you know service. You're not gonna, just going to get it from a Mac with someone who, who has an Android or whatever. So if you only have a Mac, that's probably not going to happen. But uh, a lot of these things, again, it's like the smoke and mirrors that we get to see at the keynote, and then six months from now we'll go. Damn it, almost, you know? Um, but speaking of stuff that looked really beautiful, and Joe, you brought this up, which was metal. Um, how big a deal is that? Because I keep seeing more and more 
pushing the envelope on mobile gaming. And Apple's, of course, had a, a history of this since the first iPhone. Um, I mean, how big is that going to be for people? I just, I think going back to the proof is in the pudding. I mean, look at the visuals. I yep. think that's, you know, I can, I can give you a lot of words, but I think just go back and watch that and you see kind of quickly, this is, you know, it's maybe not revolutionary in the sense that it's not a new technology per se, but to get that kind of performance improvement and to do it on, you know, a device that's in your pocket. Right. What, what's the old quote, like, uh, reality is 80 million polys a second or something yeah. like that? And they're talking about still just getting to a few million. Right. So, I mean, there's still a long way to go, but the visuals, the, it's just, you know, you see it immediately. You see the quality of that. And I think, you know, it's going to be huge. How could it not be huge? What, and what? And it's going to work on the old device. They said, too. Right. Right. Well, but, you know, one thing about that is that it will work on the old devices. So it's, you know, going straight to metal, I mean, as you guys know as developers, it's like the closer you can get to that relationship with the actual hardware, you, you get rid of those extra layers of cruft and you've got more polygons, you've got more frame rate, you know, all of these great things make a great experience. What I'm really interested in, <laughs> again, no hardware was announced, but it kind of lays a stage for, let's say, there's a hockey puck shape or size device in your living room that maybe plugs into, let's say, a, a television that can suddenly do games that are console quality almost, but for a lot lower price. And guess what? All the stuff you have on your iPhone now suddenly works on your television, um, which you know you can do, of course, a lot of this stuff with AirPlay, but having something like, let's say, native eight Apple TV playback, that would be fantastic, right? Right? Yeah. So one of the uh, funny things about uh, Metal and Swift, I guess, uh, is that with LLVM and with this new metal thing, Apple is basically completely eschewing all of these standards organizations. <laughs> and they're just like going straight for it. Yep. And they're just like, you know, basically telling everybody else to catch up. Yeah, I think well, it's kind of an interesting. That was sort of a dig at moment. OpenGL, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's like OpenGL is great, but it's like it's sort of standing in the way of the developer getting access to the true power of the A7 chip. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is also, if you follow Apple long enough, this is standard Apple procedure. You know, it's like they're going to embrace these standards for a while, and then, but when they see a better way, a better path, they're going to jump to the front of the line and say, here's where we need to be. So let's talk about Swift. We got a few, we got less than 10 minutes left. So I want to talk about Swift. How big of a deal is this? I mean, you guys on the end there are like master coder ninja guys, right? I wish. <laughs> okay, so, you, <laughs> so you're mediocre developers yeah, at the best, yeah. right? So <laughs> yeah. as a mediocre developer, how big a deal is Swift for you? It may make me less mediocre, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm hoping. Like, but uh, the thing I, I, I thought was really fun was when they, that slide with Objective-C came, came up on the screen, they, like, developers were actually gasping. I had people around me were like, oh, they're not going to touch Objective-C, are they? And then, you know, the story continued, and, and then it sort of turned into excitement. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a tremendously big deal. Um, yeah, you've got a room full of people who built a career on knowing one language, and right. it's being replaced by a different one. Um, so uh, it's going to be really interesting. Um, I don't know anything about it yet. Um, we'll see. Yeah, that's, can, that's a killer feature. Of, you can use emoji. I mean, oh, if you yeah. can use pile of poo as a variable name, you're, oh, you're set. You're, you're future proof. Like, let's, <laughs> not, let's not do that. S someone actually brought up on Twitter, I think, something that, that uh, and again, this goes back before I was a developer, but some of you old timers may remember the Pascal debacle, right, that Apple had uh, many, many years ago. But I think that this is a very, very different time. This is a very, very different space now, and Apple's in a completely different space. Um, so I don't, I don't have that same fear. I think that Swift is going to be like a really, really big deal. And I think for younger developers also who want to get their feet wet with iOS development, this is going to be a, a big, big thing for yeah, them. Yeah, it, it'll be about increasing the size of the whole developer ecosystem. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably the, the base goal of this. Yeah, so a million more fart apps in 2014 is what <laughs> no, they're, they're going to do that. Right, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a good teaching language as well. I mean, where they, we have that native compiling yeah, as you're typing. Yeah. 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 How many schools are going to go to teaching Swift? show them what's mm. happening as they're typing. Oh. Yeah, being able, yeah. being able to show as you type, that, yeah. that yeah. kind of blew my mind. Oh, like yeah. Logo for the 21st century. Yeah, exactly. That's a great, right. That you can actually cool build quote. an app and put on the store. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I mean, so, yeah. Yeah. 
And the browser? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Actually, I was curious about the browser thing and, and the guys on the panel while we get, uh, can we get a microphone to the gentleman right here? Are we out of microphones? Yeah, it's dead. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Those fighting words. <laughs> right. We'll so find, we'll find a way. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. He made the point for those on the live stream. He made the point that uh, this might be a better language. So three o'clock high out back in the schoolyard, we're gonna have a fight. <laughs> Swift versus Objective C. We'll see who brings it. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so I'm going to wind it down. We've got about five more minutes. Uh, I'm curious in just some closing thoughts on what you guys thought about the keynote and like, is this going to be a big driver for Apple sales? Is this precursor to hardware? Um, you know, how how big a keynote was this this year? Go ahead, Leander. I thought it was really big, really significant. Somebody said that it was the biggest keynote since the iPhone in 2007. Um, which, I don't know, maybe it is, you know, like it's, it looked like they were laying the foundations for some really huge areas, uh, mobile payments, the home, and health, which, you know, with these SDKs, I think are going to play out in the next couple of years and, and really see an expansion uh, of, uh, you know, into these new areas. So I think it's really hugely significant. I think everyone's going to be disappointed because there's no new hardware. Where's the iWatch? Where's the Apple TV? And, you know, there's going to be like this... <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So there's going to be a lot of complaining, but, uh, you know, f for us, it's, it's huge. Yeah. And by the way, for mobile payments, which you had asked about before, really what that means is that with Touch ID, uh, apps like PayPal and, you know, all of that kind of thing, they suddenly now have access to that. So that authentication thing, I mean, and that's a really, really big deal for those guys. So, Peter? Yeah. Um, Microphone. I'm particularly excited about, as I said before, about the stuff with Yosemite. I'm really excited to see uh, OS X evolve in, into something different than it has been before. Um, erasing that, 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 that divide between iOS and OS X, I think, is absolutely critical to Apple going forward. To Leander's point, Tim promised everybody at the outset of 2014 that Apple was going to have some blockbuster, you know, killer products in the pipeline. Um, one can argue that OS X and iOS 8 are both killer products, but I think that everyone has inferred that that means that there's going to be big hardware. So the second half of the year is going to be really interesting to watch with Apple and uh, and see what kind of gleaming, you know, boxes we're going to have to run all this cool stuff on. It is a hardware company. Keep that in mind. I, I thought it was the biggest developer keynote in years. Uh, there were no new products. Frankly, there was no room for new products. I mean, there's there's stuff that that had one slide like all the the, the cloud-based uh, infrastructure for authentication and and everything. It's, I think it was a really big keynote, and um, we'll only see the significance of it once developers start using this stuff and start building apps with it, and then um, yeah, hopefully we'll get those new product categories at a different event. Four thousand new APIs. It's almost one API for everyone at WWDC. So we've got a few yeah. weeks to wait. Adopt, uh, adopt an API week. Yes, exactly. <laughs> to, uh, uh, yeah, and I say this every year. This is the best keynote ever. I mean, they always are. They just and, and for me, the the proof is always that like I always leave and I want to stop whatever else it is I'm doing and just sit and program. Right. I just want to get back into that 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 joy that you get out of the you know, the, the constant, you know, whatever. Forget me for the moment. Point being, it's just, it's so great. It's so great to leave an event like that. And now I'm really excited about the State of the Union. I'm excited about the whole week. I think that is going, you know, some of the other uh, dub-dubs in the past have felt a little more consumer-focused, a lot of media attention on what they, what they announced and so on. But, yeah, it does feel like it's kind of back to the roots and really focused on developers. And I'm as thrilled as can be. So Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so... You say it's the best. Erica says it's the worst. Three o'clock, out back. Yeah, one more. Oh, right, the microphone. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Are they going to completely replace Xcode with Swift? No. Okay. No, no. they will r run alongside. Yeah, yeah, they'll run yeah. alongside. There's, there's still be C, still be Objective C. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so all on the same same runtime. All right, guys. We are uh, down to the last what couple did, what of minutes. Did, what did you guys think? Yeah. Thumbs up. How about uh, yeah? How
Thumbs, thumbs up. up. Yeah. Double thumbs up. <laughs> Not bad. Huh? All right. So Those people. Down. Anybody yeah. thumbs down? That's right. Yeah, Eddie Q said that it's the latter half of 2014 has got, and so, but like we talked about here, we they set the stage for potential hardware down the road that includes games, that includes home, that includes health, and these are areas in which Apple. I mean, Apple's been in games, but Pippin. I mean, <laughs> you know, they are really getting serious about integrating into every aspect of your life, not just what you, in the mobile phone in your pocket, not just the computer on your desk. So. On behalf of everybody here on the panel, I want to thank you guys, everybody at AltConf, thank them, and thank our panel very much. Thanks, guys. That's it. <laughs>